We have a special guest today. Pamela Nichol Williams is an author of a book that's coming out soon, Clearly Lies Are True. And we're very pleased to be able to interview her about her family and her time in Scientology. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to our channel, Scientology Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and I'm here with my co-host, Janice Gillen grady How are you doing today, Janice? Good, Mark. Good day, everybody. I hope everyone's having a good day. Uh, we certainly are. It's nice and sunny here in Vegas. The heat's coming down, and we're ready to put on some more shows. That's right. And and you've got this. This guest is pretty interesting. It's somebody you, you made a connection with, right? You want to tell that story briefly? Yeah, yeah um, Pam is someone who, well, we actually, our paths crossed, but we just missed each other back in 67 and 68, because I was at St. Hill and she actually went to the Royal Scotman before I did. And then she left the Royal Scotman just as I was arriving. But many years later, we, we met up and we've been in touch over the years and uh, it's it's been fun, good relationship. So it's it's going to be nice, kind of reminiscing because she was born into Scientology like I was, right. and um, and her parents were you know knew Hubbard like my parents knew and so forth. So yeah, this should be interesting. All right. Well, without further ado, let me introduce our guest, Pamela Nichols Williams. How you doing, Pam? I'm doing well. Hi, Mark. Hi, Janice. So good to see you. Hi, Pam. Good to see you, too. Yeah. How did you two reconnect, you know, years later, like Janice, did you, you guys meet on the Internet or, or what? how did that all work out? Pam, Pam found me, I think. Yeah, yeah I did. So when I started um, researching to write my book, um, I started reading everything I could. And when I found the Commodore's Messenger books that Janice had written, I was so excited because I'd never read anybody's story on the ship during the same period of time. And so that's when, yeah, there it is, yeah. Um, that's yeah. when I realized that Janice and I really did. We were like literally ships in the night, you know, we passed each other, we didn't connect on the ship. Um, I was being off boarded with my mom and my little brother um, in 68. Um, and I thought it was in Corfu from the research I'd done, but Janice um, let me know that it was in Valencia, Spain, that that's where we were docked. Um, I was little, I was like nine years old, you know, when we were right. on the ship. Um, and so sh I was off boarding because civilians were being off boarded and the Sea Org was, you know, really starting up full force and Janice was coming on right in January. Yeah, I came on at the end of January and I think you left at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah. you were there at the really beginnings of, of the sea organization she, uh, on the Royal Scotman, right? Yeah. Mark, she was there when Hubbard took off from England on the ship against regulations and being told oh. to stay. She was on that ship when it sailed down into the Med and then they, would, they wouldn't let them into Gibraltar because of their non-compliance with uh, England. So she, yeah, she was there. That's wild. That's yeah. wild. What adventure. So anyway, tell everybody a little bit about your, your family and how they got in Scientology and, and the premise of your book. And we'll let you go ahead and roll. <laughs> well, OK, thanks, Mark. Um, so I'm just going to start with this is kind of a frightening step for me. Um, all of my memories of Scientology um, have been like below the surface. You know, it's like you think of a swimming pool, like, you know, just right on the surface there, but really just below. I always remembered them but I never really spent a lot of time thinking about them. You know, I left Scientology in 1975, so I lived my whole life, raised a family, you know, worked all of those things. Um, but about 10 years ago, um, the memory started resurfacing. I had a traumatic event happen in my life and they started resurfacing and I couldn't make them go away. And so I had to start writing them down and, you know, dealing with them and starting to, you know, just, maybe just take stock of them, you know, and I tried to not push them away and just, you know, let them kind of, I guess, wash over me as I wrote them. 
and the sexual abuse um, that I suffered is part of my story um, at the hands of my father. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that in my story. Um, but it's been a journey, I'll tell you that for sure. <laughs> and as you uncover things as a survivor of trauma, you realize that your timeline is really skewed. Like things that, and also I was a child. So things that you think you remembered at a certain period of time, um, I had to put into the real chronology. You know, and Janice's book helped so much with that because I was really able to see, you know, where my story fit into that. So right. kind of just the, the background there. Um, so my parents um, met in around 1955, but prior to that in 1950, my dad had read Dianetics, you know, right after it came out and he was hooked. He was a believer, a true believer to the day he died. And he got my mom involved, you know, they met and he got her involved. And then, you know, the Wichita um, Church of Scientology folded, they had financial issues. And so then they moved to DC, to Washington, DC. And my parents had married and my dad wanted them to follow Hubbard. And so they did. So they moved to DC and from around 1957 to 1959, before Hubbard left to St. Hill and he was still there in, in DC, uh, my parents worked at the founding church of Scientology. And my father was um, one of the original clears. I found um, through all my excavation an auditor magazine, which is the Scientology magazine that you know, lists all the accomplishments and stories of Scientology. And he's listed with about 15 other people as being one of the original um, clears and getting his clear bracelet. So you become clear. Um, it's a, I don't know for all the listeners, most everybody's probably uh, uh, yeah. not Scientology, but it's an elevated state. Yeah. So um, he and my mom were there and I was born in 58 and Hubbard left to go to St. Hill, tax evasion, fraudulent claims, all those kinds of things were happening for him. And so that's when he bought St. Hill and, and moved across the Atlantic. And my parents really, they weren't ready to do that. You know, I, I think that was just um, too much. Um, my mom, you know, had just had me in 58 and then she was pregnant with my brother um, in 1961. So I was about three years old. So they decided to follow some fellow Scientologists and um, they're pretty well known, uh, Millie and John Galusha. They had a franchise in Denver. Uh -huh. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with Idenix because he he branched off on his own. He, he did Scientology Tech for a while at the franchise. Um, and then I wanna say in the 80s, he kind of morphed it into his own philosophy mm -hmm. that was called Idenix. But, in the 60s, it was Scientology and they had a franchise. So my parents followed them and we moved to Denver and they were involved in Scientology there. And, and I was a young child. And um, I know you have that picture of me when I'm with my mom and my dad, Mark. That, yeah, um, I've got that right now. Let me go ahead and show that. Yeah, there you go. So that was on our trip um, to Denver. And there we are at the Loveland Pass. And so there's my mom, um, Gloria and my father, Paul, and there I am, kind of sandwiched between them. I'm, like I said, I'm about three, three and a half years old. And she was pregnant with my little brother there, just at the very beginning of, of the pregnancy. And um, you can see my dad smoking. Surprising my mom doesn't have a cigarette <laughs> in her hand. She always smoked, but um, <laughs> she was pregnant, so maybe she wasn't for right that moment. Well, um, in those days, they still smoked when they were pregnant. They totally did. It's so true. And drank. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I wanted to touch, I, I wanted to show briefly here. This is a photograph. Wichita, Kansas is where was it the original Dianetic Foundation, whatever it was, right. was in Wichita, Kansas. And this is a photograph of LRH, that's L. Ron Hubbard there, giving a lecture in Wichita, Kansas. And you can see all the people there that are there for the lecture. And uh, so I just wanted to give people an idea of what yeah. it looked like. This is in the early 1950s, before 1955, right? Right, right. Yeah. And my father lived in Wichita, so it was perfect for him, you know, and my mom lived um, close by in Kansas. So they were Midwesterners, you know, that's where they came from. Yeah. Right. And then you so mentioned Pam, Pam um, has to go through this with a magnifying glass to find her dad. Thank <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you. I know. So I've not seen that picture before. Wow. And then you mentioned that, that during this time, Hubbard was writing the book Science of Survival. Is that right? I'm 
I believe so because the I have an old copy of it, an original copy of it um, that yeah. is typewritten that has the typos on it. You know, it's a copy of it, but all the, the typos are circled and the little carrots are in there. Um, and it has a message from him in the back, a handwritten message. And it doesn't have that, that same cover. So it's just a, a plain binding. And then in the back, it also has one of the original tone scales. Oh. Do you so, want to hold it up? Yeah, I was um, going to say, hold it yeah. up. Oh, I, you had it right there. Yeah, yeah. I thought you had it there. Hold yeah. it out here. There we go. <laughs> so it looks like this. Um, but on the inside, let's see if I can find the, there's the, the you can see it's even, it's even taped here. So it's probably been through the war. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Parents thing. So there it's typewritten and it's got the typos in there. Um, and then in the back, um, it has, which is kind of interesting. It's the original, it's kind of yellowed and and worn if i can even unfold it so you can see all of it here i don't want to tear it no can you see yeah, the that? original tone scale yep ah yeah so it's yeah so it's the original yeah, that, that's uh that's a for collectors that's basically a very valuable item because that's the original of some stuff yeah <laughs> yeah so if there's any collectors out there you can Watching. contact me and I can let them know if you're interested in buying that for big bucks. There you go. There you go. It's definitely <laughs> an Arab film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's funny because, um, not funny, but when my mom passed, um, you know, I really didn't want anything to do with any of her Scientology books. And so, um, you know, and they weren't anything like that. And so I you know, remember just donating them and, and getting rid of all of them. But this one I saved, you know, I was like, oh, no, that. there's something about that one. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. That's yeah. good. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt to show that, but basically go ahead and carry on. So what drove you to write the book and, and, uh, and, and that type of thing? What, what, how did that all get going? Right, right. So the memory started. And so in the beginning, I just started writing down like these little vignettes, these memories. And then I had to put them, like I said, in a chronology. And so reading like Janice's book and other Scientology books, it kind of helped me, especially in the 70s, you know, to put my pieces together. Um, I also talked to my brother um, who had many of the same memories. So I knew I had the right memories <laughs> that, you know, I did remember correctly. Um, and really after many years of writing it, I mean, several years, I said, you know, I kind of have a story here. You know, maybe this would be be interesting to someone else. Um, and then at the same time, like I said, some of the sexual abuse memories, you know, started to come up. They were, they were buried a little bit deeper under the surface. And so then those started to come up. So then I started to intertwine, you know, where those fit, fit in. But, um, you know, we moved to Denver, like I said, followed the Scientologists that, that my parents knew. And my father was always an advocate, a true believer, um, you know, like I said, one of the original clears and always wanted to get back to it. And I think that that was really um, an issue in their marriage and in my family's life is that my mother tried to move further and further away from it as best she could, you know, going to suburbia and starting a family. And my father kept moving her closer and closer to it and our family closer and closer to it. Can I ask, how is it that, why did they decide to move away from it? What, did something occur or did they just were tired of it or what happened? I think everything was disbanding because Hubbard left. Hubbard left the church, you know, he left the founding church and he went to, you know, purchase St. Hill and he went to St. Hill. And so it wasn't the same. And Scientologists from everything that I've read and researched, you know, had to figure out what were they going to do? Were they going to stay there? you know, and not under Hubbard, or were they going to start opening franchises? And that was a really big deal, you know, in the late 50s, early 60s, after he left, that you could do that. You, you know, now you can't do that at all. You know, it's only the Church of Scientology, and nobody can have a mission right. or a franchise. But um, in that period of time, you could open franchises, you know, and people were doing that. And so they were really good friends with the Galushas, and I think it made sense to do that. They could also buy a home. You know, they were starting a family. My mom was pregnant with my little brother. And I think it made sense to them, you know, to so do this that. Was, this was the time frame of this is like late 50s, early 60s. Is that, is that how it so works? 1961, we moved to Denver. And we okay. were there for about three years. Uh, my brother was born there. My little brother was born there. And then in 64, 
we move to Louisiana, to Slidell, Louisiana. So not the hub of Scientology at all. <laughs> it's like a tiny little city across the bridge, uh, the Pontchartrain Bridge from New Orleans. And right. in doing my research, the best that I could figure out, because I was such a young child, you know, I didn't know why we were moving there, is that my dad worked um, in aerospace and they were opening up a plant there, the Michoud plant, and they had a contract with NASA and it was the space race. And they were there were like a lot of new jobs that were being created there, like thousands of new jobs. And so I'm pretty sure they moved for that reason so that my dad, you know, could work there and, and could make more money because they weren't moving for Scientology. So, um, again, that was what my mother seemed to want at that time, but not so much my father. You know, it was always about how do we get back to it? How do we get back to it? Um, so we lived in Slidell for so 67 when we went to St. Hill. So about three years, went to school there, lived a really Southern suburban life. You know, I have some in tales. Slidell. In, in Slidell. In Slidell, yeah. Yeah, I have some tales of that in my in my book about what that was like. Um, you know, my parents really, you know, it was the 60s. Everybody was establishing themselves in suburbia. You could buy a house, you know, you could design it. You could have, you know, beautiful furniture, all of those things. And that's kind yeah. of where, where my mom was at that time. And then... How did you get to St. Hill then? So, right. Good question. So then, um, again, looking at the auditor magazines and kind of piecing together, you know, what might have been the impetus for them to finally to finally go. Um, it was a big deal. You know, it was the place to be, you know, after Hubbard had left and established it, you know, in the mid 60s. Right. Janice, you were there. Yeah, I was there. I got there in 66. Yeah. And it was busy. Yeah. right? Oh, the, the place was just buzzing and that's where they started building the castle because they needed overflow that already built the chap uh, the chapel area and qual you know and they just had to keep expanding because there were so many people coming in from the US and right. then the estate then the Australian ban happened down in Victoria so then you had Australians now joining the group yeah, yeah. very busy and South Africans people from South Africa yep. and yeah. South Africa and of course and this is when the St. Hill special briefing course was going on and these are photographs of LRH giving lectures right Janet is that in the chapel or where, where is that at? yeah th that's in the chapel 1962 is when my parents went to St. Hill for the briefing course and that's when LRH was lecturing on it himself okay yeah my mom was there when it was the tapes <laughs> <laughs> the wall of tapes the wall of tapes good to listen to so you know my dad again had been pushing you know like that was enough time you know they needed to get back into Scientology and because of that boom at St. Hill so you know reading in the auditor I mean it was advertised over and over and you know this is how you can get there you know they help you with lodging they help you with everything and they made the decision you know, I was nine um, and my little brother's about three years, three and a half years younger. And my mom took my little brother and I, but my dad did not go. He stayed back, which is so interesting to me, you know, in unearthing my story is a why. Why did he stay back? And I really think it was for money, you know, because it was very expensive at that time. It was like a thousand dollars to take the St. Hill briefing course, which was a lot of money back then, you know, um, I don't know if it would be 10,000 today, but it'd be, you know, at yeah, least 5,000. It'd be similar. Yeah. It'd be similar. Well, it, right? doesn't, it, it doesn't exist today. And the same <laughs> thing doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah. There's the irony, right? <laughs> right. And so my mom, you know, she went. That was the premise. She went. And so we stayed in. So it was an adventure as a kid. You know, because we had to fly on a double decker airplane, which they don't, that doesn't exist anymore either, right? Um, right. And we flew and we arrived in East Grinstead, well, really Tunbridge Wells, which is the little town. Yeah. Where the, yeah, where the Hareward Hotel, I, I looked so hard for pictures of that and it's no longer that with that name. And so I couldn't, couldn't find anything, but it was the hotel where Scientologists were going and staying and then they'd bust you in to St. Hill. And so we got there and 
my mom had wanted to be able to like cook for us and have a almost like a little apartment for us there. Uh huh. And so they got there. We got there, and I remember my mother. I mean, just crying. She was so upset because we had this little tiny room at the Harewood Hotel that had a hot plate and the tiniest little English fridge, you know. And it was not anything that she had imagined, especially coming from you know southern suburbia where she had a whole kitchen and everything. So right. she was not happy. She called my dad, and somehow uh, the next day we were in a suite. So they had some kind of clout or they just paid. I don't know. And so we, my little brother and my mom and I were in this suite at the Harewood Hotel. And we were there during the day. And my mom went off to St. Hill. And it was in the well, summer. So, so your mother was there in the daytime with you or she went in the evening? When, when did she go on course? Where in the daytime. Going? Yeah. Yeah. So... so we had Hold some on. free so she, time. So she left, she had somebody watching you in the daytime while she was on course? Not in the beginning, but then she did. Sounds, <laughs> yeah. like, Janice, no, sounds like Janice's upbringing. <laughs> go ahead. It was, at, least, at least I went to school in England. Did you go to school? I did. Okay. We heard it from my mom. Where did you go to school in England? I went to um, Blackwell and then Sackville in East Grinstead. Okay. Is it a and little school yeah a little school in um outside it right in east grinstead it was called blackwell okay. that was my elementary school and then sackville was right on highland uh heading out to um ashest wood or forest row so was it an episcopal school do you know like a religious school like did you have to wear a uniform no, it, it was yeah i had everyone had to wear uniform oh the elementary school no uniform but when i went to sackville I went there for like three months in uh, seventh seventh grade, uh, form one. We had to wear a uniform. Okay. Yeah. I don't all the Brit that. all the English schools had uniforms. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. I thought ours was religious, like Episcopal, from just stories my mom had told. But we had uniforms. Well, yeah, but every English school taught religion because they were all part of the Church of England. And so right. I, sh I showed up for fifth grade and I had to, suddenly I'm in this religious education class for a couple of months before the end of the year and I got an F because I didn't know anything on religious education. It sounds like my story. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the chapel because I was in fourth grade. So we were in school for a minute um, before we got on the Royal Scotman, so I'll get a little bit ahead of myself. So in the, we arrived in the summer at St. Hill. And so in the summer, you know, there wasn't school. And so we were at the Harewood Hotel for a while, kind of unsupervised. And, you know, there were always adults around, but we were pretty much in our room. Um, or there was a little like um, jungle gym outside and what they called the gardens. And then my mom must have met another Scientologist, a South African, because then we went to this woman's home and there was another little boy there and he was South African. And so it was myself, my little brother, and then this other little boy. And that was actually really fun because, you know, we weren't at the hotel and she had a lovely garden and we could run around and she had raspberries and gooseberries and we could pick them and eat them. And, um, and she was young and she had a little baby that was really cute. And so we used to play with the baby. And so those are good memories, actually. Those are really good memories. Now, let me ask you a question real quick. Janice, so did you overlap in St. Hill at the same time period yeah, as young kids? I was there from July 66 until January 68, and she was there in 67. So we were both hanging out at St. Hill around the same time. We Right. We probably did walk by each other or see each other. Yeah. Did you take any courses? Because I took a children's communication course. Yes, I did. I did the children's <laughs> communication course. I even have a photo of some of us. And what surprised me when I looked at it is... Mike Reppin's sister, Claire, is in course with me. And I, I didn't know that until like last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, look for a really small little girl that has really, really short hair. I had like a twiggy haircut. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll look and see if you're in I'll the photo. Yeah, yeah. Now, Jan now, Janice, let me ask you, was also the Barnetts there at the time too? 
Yeah, well, just Clarice. Clarice Barnett Clarice was there. there in late 67 with her mom, um, uh, Flo. Flo. Yeah, yeah. this is uh, Shelly Miscavige's sister, Cl Clarice. Yeah, because yeah, Clarice stayed with us. Her and, her and Flo stayed, boarded at our house. They rented a room from us. So like you, like how you were living, the Barnetts were like that at our house. Okay, now I have another question. I have another question for children at St. Hill. So, uh, Pam, did you hang out at St. Hill running around the grounds or were you mostly just in school and in town or how, how did that all work? Right, no, I don't have those fun memories that Janice has shared. I, I really just remember the communication course barely. I remember walking the grounds like, but I don't remember a lot of people. So I don't know if it was on the weekend or something if my mom, you know, had taken us over there. I don't know. Or it's just, it's kind of like a, a faded memory that one I don't have strong memories of. Yeah. But I think mostly we were at the hotel and then my mom found, you know, childcare for us at this woman's home and then started school. So when school started, we went to the, what I called the Episcopal school, but like you said, religious education for the Church of England, you know, that was compensatory. So that happened. Um, I remember that we had to wear, maybe you'll remember this, Janice, plimsolls, which were like kid. Yeah, <laughs> sneakers. <laughs> sneakers. And my mom couldn't find any. And like, she just couldn't find my size. And so they'd always loan them to me and they were too big and I flopped around. And I do remember that. Um, I remember the uniform. I remember that um, they would give me a break on spelling tests because of the English spelling versus the American spelling. And so like, you know, the extra vowels and endings and things like that. And they were very kind to me. Um, I do remember that. Like, I think they felt sorry for, for me. And my little brother was not a happy for at school and he was always, um, upset. And so I would always have to go over to his classroom, you know, and kind of console him. So um, we weren't there long, though. Not long now, at all. Let me ask, let me ask you something. Did the English kids tease you because of your accent? A little, a little, not mean, but like, I think more they were like, I was interesting. I was like fascinating right. to them, you know, like yeah. I was something they'd never seen before. So it was like, you know, a unique thing. Yeah, so they didn't tease right. me too much. They were just more interested in it. Like when you talk, you know, staring at you. Right. Yeah, they'd come up to me, say something. I go, something. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and they'd run off laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm very shy. So I, I didn't really talk much at all. I have another question because I was not there. But anyway, Janice, was Hubbard there at the time? Were the kids there at the time or were they gone? No, the kids were there, uh, 60, 66 and 67, the kids were there. And if she'd come to St. Hill more often, she probably would have played with Arthur because you're Arthur's age. Same age, yeah. Same age, where Terry and I, my sister and I, we played with Suzette and Quinton. And my brother was Diana's age, and Mike Mao was Diana's age. And, um, oh, there was another guy, Rick who was Diana's age. And those three boys were always, where's Diana? And trying to chase <laughs> Diana. And Suzette and Quinton and Terry and I were, were the gods. And we would protect Diana and we'd tell her where they were. And we'd kind of, okay, you come this way, you know, so that she could avoid them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, no, I don't have any of those memories either because um, I didn't get to know them until the ship. Yeah. Until right. Or else Scottman. Yeah. So yeah, but, is that the next step of the story that we're going to tell? That's the next step of the story. Yeah. So you brought it up, Janice. Um, Arthur and I are almost exactly the same age. Um, I think he was right. born in June and I was born in the fall. So the, my parents and my mother was pregnant at the same time as Mary Sue when she was pregnant with Arthur um, back in Washington, D.C. So that's kind of and a... You, and you and I are the same age. I just had my birthday yesterday and I was Aww. born in Happy I was born in 1958, too. Yeah, so. Oh, it's a good year. <laughs> it's a really good year. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're at St. Hill, and uh, my mom is, you know, taking the St. Hill briefing course, and she's got us in school now. And then one day, we come back to the hotel, and she says, don't change out of your uniforms. We're going to be going somewhere. But she couldn't tell us where. It was very secretive. And so, you know, you're curious, but, you know, 
I was a very compliant child, so I didn't ask any questions. You know, we just did whatever we were told. And so we stayed in our uniform. Somebody came to pick us up because my mom, you know, didn't have a car or transportation. So we went in a car and I remember it was dark. So I know it was nighttime. It felt very late, you know, but you're a kid. So I'm not sure, like, you know, if it was midnight or 9 p.m. But we went in this car and we drove for a very long time because we were driving to Southampton to the docks. And we got there and it was very eerie because I'd never been to a dock. I'd never seen a huge ship before like the Royal Scotman. And so you could only make out the outlines of it also. So it was kind of ominous, you know, you could see the smokestacks. And, and I remember like not being, not being scared though. Cause as a kid, you're kind of excited. Like it's something new, right? And so we got out and he told us we had to be very quiet the man told us we had to be very quiet. And my mom had packed a footlocker. So like a, a like a G.I. Joe, that's the only thing I can you know, equate it with, footlocker that was a ugly army green. And it had her name on it and our address in Louisiana. And she had put all our stuff in there. And so they took that and that was boarded onto the ship. Now yeah. a footlocker is like a trunk? Like a trunk, yes. yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Think of it like a trunk. Yeah. So Foot Locker Man. That's the only, like I said, that's the only thing I can equate it to. But yeah. So probably maybe like um, five feet by three feet. You know, it's it wasn't huge, but it was big enough to have right. all of our worldly belongings in it. Um, right. But it was it wasn't a store that sold shoes. No. <laughs> it was not. No, not that Foot Locker. No. Yeah. No. Sorry. Now yeah. this this is the Royal Scotman. In 1967, I think Janice before it was bought by Hubbard, right? And yeah. uh, this is in England. And it had been a cattle ferry before, yeah. and it also done other service during World War II and everything, right, Janice? Yes, it did. And it, it carried the troops in World War II. Yeah. Yeah. And so, that's, what so we, like. that's what it looked like when we got on. In now, what, what did your mother tell you as to why you were going to this ship? Do you remember? No, she didn't tell us. <laughs> I, it was just, this is what we're, we're going. And um, like I said, it was very quiet. And, you know, we had to board. So I remember walking up the, the you know, gangplank. Gangway. And, gangway, thank you. And holding onto the metal rails, you know, and then we went down. So we were, you know, down in the black part of the ship. So we went down right. to where the births were. Births, right? Births, birthing. Right. Um, yeah. And it was very dark. And so we followed this man and my mother, you know, walked with us. And there were all these bunk beds when we finally got to this room. And So you were taken to the woman's dormitory? Um, or, the, or did you have a cabin with your mother? No, I did not have a cabin with my mother. No, no. It was like kids. It was like the kids' dormitory at that time. Oh, there were okay. The nursery. Yeah. Now, Janice, Janice, let me, let me uh, Pam, hold on one second for a second. Janice, what's the history of this right now as far as the ship? Why is it there in England? And had they just taken possession of it? Or what was the deal? Yes, Jovan Staden had been sent. Jovan Staden was on the Avon River and Hubbard wanted a bigger ship because the Avon and the Diana, the Enchanter, were too small. So he wanted a bigger ship so that the, his family and other family members could uh, go there because my mother, when she joined the Sea Project, it was with the promise from Hubbard that they would get a bigger ship so that uh, us children could join her. So he sent Joe Van Staden on a mission and Joe purchased the Royal Scotman and got it delivered down to Southampton where then St. Hill, all the AO was moved on board, all the file cabinets and, and the public such as Pam and her mother. Okay, and then the idea was then to sail it away or whatever that was where gonna be where you all were gonna live and the training is that, or mother was gonna do the training? Is that what you recall, Pam? Well, again, as a child, you know, my world was so different from my mother's on the ship because we didn't see my mother. So okay. once we got there, um, we were in the birth, you know, birthing for the or the nursery, because I think those were two different places at that time, Janice. I think the kids were in there and then we went to a different place that was the nursery. And so 
it was dark when we got on. My mom put me on the top bunk, my brother on the bottom. She covered me up with one of those scratchy wool blankets. It felt, you know, and I was still in my uniform and goodbye and left. And the next thing, you know, so that was the maiden voyage, the night of the maiden voyage. Um, right. Right. So it took off, um, you know, in my book, I have um, the quotes from Hannah Eltringham about that maiden voyage, you know, and the rough seas and how crazy all of that was because um, there was a storm and they had a really yes. hard getting out. So, you know, never having been on a big ship like that, um, you know, I heard the noises <laughs> probably from the engine room and all of that, you know, and, you know, felt the movement, but slept probably through most of it. But that next morning, my mom came and got us and she said, you know, come on, we're going up. And we went and had breakfast, I remember. And then we went up on the top deck and it was all wet. Everything was, you know, covered in water and people were mopping and people were, you know, cleaning things off. And my mom took my brother over to... And Janice, maybe you can help me with this. There was, there was a bell that was enclosed. Yeah. What was that for? The ship's bell? Well, on the on the folks on the front of the ship, right. we had a bell to ring for when they dropped the anchor, they would ring it. And also going through fog, you would ring the bell. Okay. But it was enclosed, right? Kind of, it wasn't, um, like I remember it being covered or or... I don't know, enclosed, that's the best word that I can come up with. So, and and you could reach it, right? On the deck. Yeah, you could easily reach it, yes. You could easily reach it. Yeah. So we were over in that area and my mom had a rag and she said to my brother to start, my little brother to start shining it. Shine, we need to shine up the bell. And it's because everybody was just trying to clean up because Hubbard was coming. Hubbard was gonna be coming up on deck and everybody needed to be busy and, you know, cleaning up. And so my, you know, my brother was not too happy about that. Um, you know, he was little. So I grabbed a rag and I remember I walked over to like the railing and I can't tell you if it, would that have been the front of the ship, the bow or the? That would be at the front. At the front, right? And so I went over to the railings and you know, this the Royal Scotland was not in good shape. <laughs> No. <laughs> the paint was peeling. It was, it was a rust bucket. It was a rust bucket. Exactly. So I remember that like my rag would get caught, you know, on the paint. And so I'm, you know, rubbing it over and everything. And so Hubbard comes on board or comes up, you know, he's on deck and I was waiting to be praised. I mean, you know, my mom, you know, he was revered. And so my mom said, you know, we need to make sure it's clean, you know, for him. And he walked over towards the railing where I was, looked right over me, right past me, didn't even acknowledge that I was there, didn't talk to anybody. He was just walking around and he was in inspection mode. And I always remember that, that, you know, he just had this presence, but there was no connection, you know, right. with the people. Yeah, that he didn't, he didn't speak, didn't speak to my mother. I mean, he knew my mother. Is, no. is that the first time you remember seeing him? That's the only time I remember, no, yeah. On the ship are the only times that I remember seeing him. And I have um, another story from when we were tutored that I saw him. Um, we okay. performed for them. Okay. For but, but I, have a, I have a question for you. Was your mother public or staff? I mean, why was she cleaning a bell if she was public? I don't have any idea, Janice, but she was public, to my knowledge, because she was audited by um, Scott Leland. Did you know Scott Leland? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Unless she she was going through an ethics handling and had to do amends. Or maybe Janice, since they were just they were getting everybody on board, they wanted everybody to contribute contribute somehow. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. The public usually they stayed up on A deck and B deck, and the crew were down in the dorms. Uh, the kids, yeah, the the kids were down in the steward quarters. Uh, that's where the kids, uh, the nursery yeah, but, was. But, was sleeping. But this was the first. This was the first voyage. Maybe they hadn't had all that worked out yet. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and I, I there's Hubbard. Yeah, I think there's some truth to that. In that, you know, it was the Sea Project before the Sea Org, and you know, there were no uniforms. There was none of that. So right. you know, and I remember, and you know this better than I do, Janice, the um, Jessup children. Yes. Being with us. Tommy. Yeah. 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 So they were on the ship with us. So, you know, it, there were children 
and we did not see my mom. So I know that she was audited by um, Scott Leyland. Um, I know that she didn't finish the St. Hill briefing course because we went onto the ship. And I also know that she was, she wrote about ethics. So Clarice was her ethics officer. And I found some documents of her writing about how fabulous ethics was and ethics, you know, helped get the tech in and, you know, writing her testimonial about receiving ethics and how beautiful it was. So there may have been some things going on there, but I don't know what they are. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, she didn't ever have the the rag on her arm, the white rag on her arm. I don't remember any of that, but she really couldn't see us. We really saw very little of my mother. You know, maybe an occasional she'd walk by, you know, and get a glimpse of us or, or get a chance to come see us. But we really right. didn't see her on the ship. So we were tutored alongside the Hubbard kids. So how old were you then? How, roughly how old were you then? I was nine. Okay. Yeah. Maybe just turned 10. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so we were um, tutored alongside the Hubbard kids. So Arthur was in there and Suzette. And Quentin was not, though. There it is, the study. <laughs> Janice, Janice, tell everybody what this is, Janice. Well, on the original Royal Scotman, this was called the smoking room, and it was up on the promenade deck. And those are chairs, and people would sit around in those chairs with tables and smoke and drink. There was a bar right there. And then... Um, Later on in 68, when I was there, it actually was converted over to being Hubbard's office and we called it the research room. And, and there it is with the King Edward is no longer up there. It was a, it's now a mirror. And then uh, all the tables and chairs were moved out. There's two of the chairs out there, which the messengers sat in, but it was all changed and the floor was polished up and the Curtains, as you said, Pam, the curtains were red originally, and then later on they got changed to being gold, like a yellow gold. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that was a flashback to see that study. That picture. <laughs> well, so, that, that's, where, that's where you were being tutored in there, that's right? That's where you were tutored. Right. And, and, her, and her tutor happened to be Sylvia Hare, who mm -hmm. is the mother of Fred and James Hare and uh, Tina Hawkins. Or Tina Wilson, yeah. who was married to Jeff Hawkins. Yeah. And she was an older Scientologist. Yes. Yeah. At that time. I'm not, you know, and I was a child, so I mean, older is relative, but um, she definitely was much older than, you know, my mother and the other yes. on board. And she was probably your height at that time. <laughs> she was. She was. She was. I don't even know if she hit five foot. <laughs> yeah, no, she was a small little woman and um, so sweet to us. Though. So sweet. So she had no supplies. You know, she had nothing to teach us with. And so they had the World Book Encyclopedias. I remember she had those. And so we would read from the World Book Encyclopedias. Um, we'd learn some silly songs and we performed for Hubbard um, and other. Scientologists, I don't know who they were, but I remember going up and it was um, mealtime because so, he had this huge plate of fruit in front of him, I remember seeing. And um, we sang this song and, you know, and performed for him. And it was kind of fun. Um, I remember just being nervous. Um, but really, we didn't learn anything. Um, my fondest memory of the Hubbard kids, though, is Quentin because he was so sweet. And um, he wasn't tutored with us. So it was Suzette. Hubbard just sat in, I mean, um, Arthur just sat and drew because he's an artist. And so, you yeah. know, he's a very good artist. And so he would just draw. Um, and the other kids, I really don't don't remember. But I remember Suzette would um, sit up on the, not in the chairs, but up like where the curtains were. You could sit up on the, the tops of them. On, on the back of the chair. On the, the back of the chairs. The, bench, the benches around the edge. Exactly, that she would yeah. sit up there, yeah. Um, and so, you know, that was that was what we did. But Quentin one day took me um, to go see his quarters. We were walking around, like he would walk around the ship with me. So he was very kind. You know, nobody was, did, he didn't need to do that. Nobody needed to pay attention to me. And I remember um, we went to his quarters and I remember they were so nice. 
compared to, you know, where we were in the bunks. And um, he said, you know, don't you have, don't you have a room like this? And I said, no, I don't have a room like this. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, we, I remember we were docked and I remember looking out at the docks and talking to him and he was so animated and so sweet and, you know, talked about all the things that he loved, you know, flying and things like that. So. Yeah, and he'd go go down the corridors, <laughs> be in an airplane. <laughs> exactly. But I remember he was dressed in the whites, like the the white pants and the white shirt, beginning of Sea Org uniform. I have a memory of oh, that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So were you guys down in the Mediterranean then at that point? We were. We were. So we, I remember, I do remember sailing through the Strait of Gibraltar because I remember everybody went out on deck. So it was after the storm and going through there. And, you know, that was a very cool memory of seeing both sides, you know, of the land and going through that. Um, and then we were in Cagliari. Um, yeah. Yes. And Valencia, Spain. Yeah. yeah. And then Valencia, Spain is where we were offboarded. So it was after Christmas, because remember my mom was really sad that she couldn't give us Christmas presents. Like she found little trinkets. She must have had, you know, liberty to go off the ship and get some little trinkets. Um, and, you know, she felt really badly about that. Um, but then I remember we were boarded off the ship. And in researching it, I learned the history. Um, like I said, I thought it was Corfu, but it was Valencia. And civilians were being offboarded because you were coming on, Janice. And it was turning into the Sea Org, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and also shortly after that was when they set up Ale um, the advanced organization in Alicante. But they moved it from the ship. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think at the, the time when you left, yeah, for services. But I think at the time when you left was where everyone had to sign the seal contract. And if they didn't, then they, they were sent off. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, my mother was clearly not ready for that, and she had two small children in tow, which they didn't want on the ship. <laughs> you know, it was it was changing. Um, and just to, to, you know, the history better than I do, Janice, but, you know, the reason that Hubbard bought the ship and went on the ship was because he started to experience the same problems that he had in D.C., which was with taxes and Scientologists were going to start to be banned, right, in St. Hill. Yeah, they, he was already, um, they wouldn't renew his visa in England, which is why he got the Enchanter and also the Avon River and ended up going down to Tangier and then over to Las Palmas and staying down there until the ships came down. And then when then he flew back to England to get the Royal Scotman and sail it down. But yeah, he had to leave England as a undesired alien. Right. And he decided to become a writer in seclusion. And there was some um, issues with how much money Scientology was making um, that I found in my research. And so um, it was a way for him to escape all that, right? Right, right. right. All, of, all of those financial but, issues. Yeah, and he didn't really escape it. It still followed him wherever oh, he went. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, because then they wouldn't let you go into courts. They wouldn't let you right. dodge. Right. So well, yeah, we actually, well, when you guys uh, went through that storm, Hubbard actually tried to go into Gibraltar to get out of the storm and they wouldn't let him because of him leaving England with the ship not having passed any safety inspections. And I mean, it was, it was a very dangerous what he did bringing the ship down to the Mediterranean. But anyway, you, you, Slowly over time, they did things to fix up the ship and pass inspection. But that was very wrong what he did with all you people aboard. Yeah, it's a miracle. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it really it, exactly. It is a miracle that it's a miracle that nobody died, got killed on that ship. Yeah. Right. We did have an old lady die of old age, but nobody got killed or badly injured. You know, we did have someone lose two fingers. But I think that was the worst injury anyone had, which yeah. is a miracle. Yeah, yeah, it really and was. You get, and you feel that way when you read Janice's book in detail, because I'll never forget reading it the first time. Went, How the heck did nobody die or go overboard? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. Anyway. So, you know, I'm, I'm almost thankful that I was a small child and, you know, <laughs> I didn't know how dangerous it was, right? Had no, no idea. Um, <laughs> But that speaks to how devoted everyone was, 
you know, yes. nobody said, you know, I'm getting off, you know, at the next port, you know, everybody was, was um, devoted. Yeah. They well, were, there were some, there were some people that were Spartan. Uh, they're like, this is dangerous. I'm out of here. There were the, some of those, okay. but not enough. <laughs> Not a, right, not enough. There you go. Yeah. So my mother was not one of them <laughs> um, until, you know, the choice was sort of made for her that, like you said, everybody had to sign the billionaire contract. She had two little children. She was not ready, you know, for that kind of life or immortality, you know, and they didn't really want her there with the kids. So remember, we waited a really long time to probably go through like, you know, to get cleared and flew home. So we flew home to, you know, Louisiana, back to Louisiana, where my dad had been working. And we were there for not very long um, before we left again. So, you know, my parents had been away from each other. Um, my mom was probably not in any better shape. I would say she was in worse shape mentally at that time um, than she had been before. You know, she'd been trying to escape it. And then she'd been not only immersed in it, but, you know, been on the ship and right. what ethics handling was, I mean, she was full force immersed back into it. And it wasn't um, the friendly place that she had been in when she was in D.C. and working for Hubbard. So a very different, right. different experience for her. So she was not happy. My father was not happy. He wanted her to continue and to finish. She needed to finish the annual briefing course. She needed to get more auditing and training. And they had this huge fight um, with some slapping involved. And, you know, it wasn't a pretty scene. And the next thing I knew, she was asking us whether we wanted to stay with her, live with her, or live with um, my dad. And, you know, if we were going to live with her, we needed to go with her. But I didn't, you know, we didn't even know where she was going. So, you know, she said Los Angeles. And you know, I had no idea where that was or what that was about. I knew I knew California was a state. That's about all I knew. And the decision was made for us. My mother left and my dad stayed and kept working. And we stayed in, in Slidell with him. And she went to L.A. for more training and auditing at the Advanced Organization of Los Angeles, AOLA, right? I just opened up in 68. Oh, OK. AOLA. Yes. AOLA, sorry. Yeah, AOLA um, had just opened up in, in 68. And so that was where she went. She moved um, and she was out there for probably several months before we followed because we had to wait till we finished school. And then my dad drove us cross country to Los Angeles. Um, I remember that trip it was about a three day trip. He did it um, in three days. <laughs> so it was a whirlwind. Um, but before that in Slidell, um, our home was foreclosed. And I have really vivid memories of that. So, you know, my recollection is that all the furniture, you know, was taken out and there was nothing in the house when we left. And remember the vans coming and we could take one toy with us on the trip. And that was it. You know, that was very sad as a kid. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very sad as a kid, and and during that period of time, um, you know, my sexual abuse with from my dad started when I was around four, and it had continued off and on through Denver and then Slidell, and um, with my mom absent, um, that was not a good time, um, because he was he was left alone to his own devices, and so then we took the trip to Los Angeles, and we met my mom at the Redwood Motel in Los Angeles, which is. Um, since since then, the wagon wheel that was on the front of the hotel is no longer there. <laughs> I looked it up to see if I could find a picture of that. Um, but it was this hotel in downtown Los Angeles because um, AOLA, right, it was in downtown LA. I mean, the, the homes yeah. that we found, it, it was yes. old craftsman homes. It was not like a desirable part of Los Angeles where Scientology first started in Los Angeles. Um, and so we were downtown LA and that's where the motel was. We met there. We saw my mom. That was their, our quick reuniting. And then they found an apartment, which was near Olympic Boulevard, if you know LA, which is pretty much downtown and other Scientologists lived there. And here's another parallel, which is, um, Doreen Smith. Doreen yeah. Smith. Yes. Charity Smith's daughter. 
Charity Smith's daughter, right? So Doreen was one of the messengers with you, Janice, right? Yes, Doreen actually married my brother and became Doreen Gillum, right. and her nickname was Doe. Yeah, yeah. It's so strange to me that we have these parallels. It's so crazy. So yeah. she, she lived in the upstairs apartment. We lived in a downstairs apartment, and she lived in an upstairs apartment. And I remember before she went to the ship, so this is in 68, I remember her in her full um, Sea Org uniform. Like she had on all of the, the Sea Org. And I just remember being like stunned. Like she just right. looks so important. She looks so regal. You know, she just, and she was what, a couple of years older than I was, you know? No, I thought she was your age. She was the same age as Arthur. Okay. She looked a lot older to me. Yeah. I felt like a little kid compared to her. Yeah. And she came to the ship in 1970. Oh, okay. Not so, 70. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we were in the apartment from 68 until 71, that apartment, before we moved to our next apartment in L.A. So I would have seen her then in 1970. Right. Okay, before yeah. she went. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, because we first moved there in 68. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know her well. Like, we didn't interact, I remember, because she was probably very busy at the orgs. You know, and yeah, I well, was... Yeah, she, well, she hung out at CC and helped my mother... You know, did message runs for my mom and stuff like that. Okay, so yeah. possibly we did cross paths, and I don't, I don't remember. I mean, I, I don't think I was in the same echelon. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it was far more important than I was. You know, especially at Celebrity Center. Um, Were you around Celebrity Center? I was going to show this picture. This is a picture of the original Celebrity Center. Yes, yes. So in '68, so my mom. About one more story before I get to my celebrity center. Um, so in 68, so my mom was, you know, getting auditing and, and taking coursework at AOLA. And my dad got a job. And so he was working. And she was probably from my, the best that I know of, you know, her path. Um, she, she was clear number 700. I know that. Um, and I believe she was working on the OT levels at that time you know, in um, the early 69, 70. And she had psychotic episodes. And she had several of those. And she was taken to a safe house, which to my memory would have been the Lanai Apartments, which was another apartment building that was in Los Angeles. And I remember we went to visit her there um, afterwards. My dad took me to visit her there. Um, she was in better shape when I saw her. She had the psychotic episodes, you know, in the apartment building where we lived. And my little brother and I were home when that happened. And then she was taken there and she was there for, for some weeks. Um, and sadly, due to that, you know, it's the whole premise of my story. Would this have happened anyway because of my mother's just own propensities and mental health? Or what did it get exacerbated by Scientology? She became severely agoraphobic where she could mm -hmm. not leave apartment she could not go out she could not really engage in life and so that happened during that period of time when we lived um, at the apartments on Bonnie Bray um, where Doreen also lived and so she came back and then we moved to um, Lafayette Park Place so before that happened though Mark I did start volunteering at Celebrity Center and my dad got sick. He had multiple sclerosis um, and he probably had it for years and years and years, but it was finally diagnosed when we came to Los Angeles and he was in a wheelchair within like six months of his diagnosis. And so then we moved to the other apartment building, um, which was closer to ASHO, so another Scientology organization. <laughs> <laughs> but at the very beginning of his illness, my mom had stopped because of her agoraphobia, had stopped receiving auditing and training through Scientology. My dad was now disabled. So I was sort of volunteered. <laughs> you can't have our money. You can't have us. But here you can have our daughter was oh, really, I think, how Typical. it works. Typical. Typical. 
Exactly. So I remember, you know, it was it was blessed by both my parents. And I had done a little bit at AOLA, uh, like a couple of maybe, um, again, maybe communication courses. I don't really remember, but started to do a little bit there. And then all of a sudden I was going to Celebrity Center. So the good part about Celebrity Center, as Janice knows, was her mother. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that was that was the lovely part of it. Um, and that she was just she could bring anybody together. You know, she was just really good at that and making it a positive experience. And so I through doing my research, too, I didn't know at the time what my job was, but I was there with um, another young Scientologist, Tristan Romero. I don't know if that name is familiar. No, no. no. But um, so we, he was probably a couple of years older than I was, and I was just 13, just turning 13, so summer before. And we were to combine the files, the Rolodex files of AOLA and Celebrity Center. So what do they call that? The master files. Address them. Address oh, central files, central files, but addresso that's the word. Yeah. Addresso. So we literally had all of these almost like huge Rolodexes where you would pick up the card, you'd try to find it. And, you know, if it was AOLA, so you try to find it if there was already one in Celebrity Center, you know, and if there wasn't, then you got to move it over there. I mean, it was the most tedious work <laughs> in the world, but I loved it. I loved it. I mean, and partly because my home life was very terrible. You know, my mother was agoraphobic and not, you know, going out and, and it was a, not a good existence. And my dad was disabled. Right. Can I ask you a question? Your mother, you said she was clear number 700. Was she on her OT levels at, at that time? Like, did she ever get onto those OT levels? I suspect she did, Mark. I've not been able to. The only reason to... I ask is because I don't know how familiar you are with them, but OT2 and OT3, that could that could set you spinning for sure. Exactly. <laughs> right, Janice? The stuff that's on OT2 and OT3, yeah. Yeah, especially three can get you spinning. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. And so, you know, from what I've heard in the research that I've done, I haven't been able to find that document of, of what it was. Um, my guess is yes. That that's what she would have been doing because she was already clear. So she would have been working on those levels. My father yeah. do those OT levels. Um, and as I've learned, it can either send you down or it can inspire you <laughs> to be even more, you know, maybe narcissistic than you already were. So um, I think that's what happened to my dad and for my mom, you know, it spun her down. And so that was, it was not a good place home. And so, Celebrity Center was fun, you know, even if you were doing that, yeah. that work, it was, it was fun. And, you know, I was there when um, it was just all starting. Ray Midoff had just arrived <laughs> at Celebrity Center, you know, in the early 70s. And um, right. I remember training and, and auditing with him. And I remember, um, you know, they would have these big celebrations there for when the stats were up. And they would bring in Andre Champagne. And everyone would drink in the middle of the afternoon <laughs> and celebrate, you know, the upstats. And um, so that's, you know, number of trainings, you know, and, and people passing courses and reaching higher levels. And I, you know, had never had that. I was just 13. And I got so sick. I got so sick. <laughs> and Ray Medoff got me home to the, my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and the minute I got there, I threw up, <laughs> like, oh, like all over the floor, you know, of the apartment building. And you were 13, right? You were drinking champagne at 13. Exactly, right? Exactly. So that's that's a fun story. But um, you know, Kenny Lipton, Peggy Lipton's you know, brother. Yes. Was there. Yeah, we know Kenny. We know Kenny very well. He's a good. He was yeah. a good friend. We're, of we're actually going to do a show on Kenny. Yeah. Oh, oh, good. is yeah. Kenny still with us? No, no, he died he like 1998. 98 no, or 99? No, Janice, it was 99. 99. 99? Yeah. He was here in Las Vegas with us at the time. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. So he was there. Um, and, um, you know, it was a fun place. They, they, your mom put on, you know, poetry by candlelight. And, and it was really yeah. that mission to bring in these artists. 
wasn't even about celebrity, you know, at that time. It was about artists and it was about honoring artists and bringing them in and and helping them share their gifts with the world and, and the world of Scientology. You know, it was right. Richard Maria and Karen Black and all those people. So it was a really good place to be. Um, and I was there for, you know, a little bit of time. I did training there. Um, I remember doing the TRs there and then the auditing and, you know, the training to become an auditor. And so I was about 14 or 15 at that time. And Celebrity Center was still there. I used to walk there. <laughs> um, I trained with, this is a good one, with um, Carla Kent and her mom was, I mean, her daughter was Sandy Kent. Oh, okay. I know Sandy. Yeah. 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 So her mom, Carla Kent, I trained with her. And so one of my jobs was to walk up to get her because she didn't drive either. <laughs> so I was too young to drive. And so I would walk up and I would pick her up at her apartment and then we'd walk together, you know, to the org. And then we'd do our training together. Um, so did all of that. Then my parents moved to Asho. So that was happening right around that time too. And my mom went to Asho some. She also did some trans, I don't want to say um, translating, but she would listen to tapes and she typed up the up the tapes. Transcription. 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 Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just want, to, just want to interrupt real quick. ASHO for our viewers is American St. Hill organization. And that's where the briefing course, the St. Hill special briefing course was delivered in the United States was at the American St. Hill organization, otherwise known as ASHO. Anyway, go ahead. Well, yeah. also, also power processing. Five yeah, and five yeah. A was yeah. delivered at the Asho. Right, right. And I think you had a picture mark of Asho during the the seventies because it was. I do really on Temple crazy. Street. Yeah, so right down the street from where we lived, we lived on Lafayette Park Place, which was like a row of apartment buildings. Um, and then you could just walk up to Temple, and then you could walk down to Rampart, um, and it was right there. So it was within walking distance for my mom. Um, like I said, she went there some, her agoraphobia, um, you know, was still there. She was, she was starting to try to figure out what to do because my dad at that time then was put into a convalescent hospital. His um, multiple sclerosis was too severe. He couldn't um, be at home. She couldn't care for him any longer. And so that's during that period of time, I think that's when she started to do some of the transcription thing that also because of what had happened with her with those psychotic episodes at AOLA, I think that um, Asha was kind of handed her as a problem <laughs> to fix, right. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, I really think that. And so she was not happy there. Um, she was not happy there. I found some, a very interesting document um, when I was a teenager that she had written during that period of time, which was her overts and her omissions. So, you know, if you're not a Scientologist, it's like your confessions. And right. in that, she wrote about um, how she had not been there for my, my little brother and I, things that she felt guilty about that she had not done. She also wrote about how she had tried to convince my father that Scientology was bad um, and the things that were not good about it. She wrote about how she had um, nattered, which is like speak badly about um, <laughs> ASHO personnel and about Scientology. And so I think that gave me such insight into, you know, I, I found it as a teenager, but didn't really understand it, you know, until I was right. in um, into where she, where she was, you know, that's where she was in her life. And now we were poor because, you know, my father wasn't working anymore. We were on um, disability and, you know, food stamps and things like that. And so that was really hard for her. So of her own volition, Without Scientology's help, she got a job. <laughs> oh. And maybe Scientology's help, because I don't know what she put on her resume. <laughs> you know, she had to say she had some experience. So um, somehow she was able to get somebody to hire her. And we live near near the Wilshire district. And so she became a legal secretary, you know, and she, she got a job. So during that period of time, while she was doing that, I was still doing auditing and training um, at Celebrity Center, but then it shifted. That facility was no longer um, used and they bought a home in like the, it's near the Greek theater in Los Angeles, up in the Los Feliz area. 
Before, yeah, Janice, you know that Celebrity Center before they bought La Brea. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, the manor. There was like a manor or something. Uh -huh. I remember my mother had was renting it because she thought it was a better location than down on Eighth Street. You know, in the next to Alvarado Park or MacArthur's Park on Alvarado Street. But yeah, so she wanted to upgrade and she rented this house and everyone loved it and they moved and and then Hubbard said the stats are going down, what changed? And someone said, Oh, Celebrity Center moved to this new location. So then Hubbard was like, move them back to the old location where they were last doing well. So back to Eighth Street they went. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I didn't go back to 8th Street. <laughs> so for, for maybe for a minute. Um, but the Manor House was, it was a very cool old home, you know, and I could see your mom thinking that was a good idea because it was in a much more upscale area. Because, yes. you know, I mean, they still write about MacArthur Park today and the, you know, the Los Angeles Times. I mean, it's, it's drug deals and it's, and it, it wasn't any better then. It wasn't so many drug deals, but more alcoholics and bums. And, you know, it, it was not a pretty place. You know, it was downtown right. LA. Um, just, to just to clarify for our viewers who are, were in Scientology, we're not we're not talking about the Fifield Manor, which is now the Celebrity Center on Franklin. This right. was another right. house. This was a different house. Anyway. In Los Feliz. Yeah. yeah, up near like on your way to the Greek theater. And I remember... Yeah. Um, and is Bob Omblad still alive? Bob Robert Oh, wow. I don't I know. I, I, I think don't know. I think he is because okay. he was working with Rinder when Rinder got out of Scientology. Oh wow! I, I think he is. Okay. Yeah, because he was active and he had a motorcycle. And I used to get on the back. He would pick me up at Lafayette Park Place and I'd get on the back of his motorcycle and he'd take me to the manor house. <laughs> the one okay. over the Los Yeah. So I have fond memories of that because that was very fun as a teenager to get to ride on the back of a motorcycle, which my mother did not want me to do. But as we know in Scientology, you know, she didn't squash it. She didn't right. say, no, oh, you can't, because that was the only way, you know, for me right. to get there and for me to do that. And she was still in enough that, you know, she didn't want to have anybody telling her, you know, what she needed to do with me. Um, and so I did that for a while. And starting around 1975, um, I would started, you know, I was in high school at that time and I started to, my interest in it started to wane. I think part of that had to do with, you know, I was a teenager and interested in boys and interested in, you know, in life um, and what real life was like. Um, and I had gotten involved in some, you know, fun activities, um, organizations that were just, you know, like dances and car washes and fun things like that. And so I started doing that and I was still doing, like I said, a little bit of the auditing and the training and doing that um, in the evenings because he would pick me up in the afternoon after school and then going up there and, and, and doing that. But I wasn't as interested in it. And I will tell you, there was a different vibe up there in that it was so, your mother had created such a safe place and hub for celebrities and for artists, you know, on the one on 8th Street, that right. it probably didn't feel the same. Um, and it felt more like an AOLA, you know, where it was this older home and it was just, you know, Scientology training and auditing happening. Um, and so I did, it wasn't there long. Um, and I had stopped going. And one day my boyfriend, who's my husband, um, was at our apartment and my mom was not there. And we got a knock on the door. And these two Scientologists were there, people that I knew from Celebrity Center. And they said, so where have you been? You know, we haven't seen you around for a while. So it was there reaching out, you know, to bring me back. Prior to that, I had really gotten the hard sell on the Sea Org. You know, I was at the right age. I had been involved enough, you know, like we need to bring her in. And that's when I think things were also shifting during that time to be even more maybe dogmatic with the Sea Org yeah. during those yeah. mid seventies. And so I had, you know, wanted actually to do it. And prior to those guys showing up at our door, um, I had come home one day and I was ready. I think I was mad at my mom and, and, you know, had listened to everything they said and I was convinced and I started packing, you know, like a duffel bag with all my stuff. And I was, I was ready. And my mom and I got into this really bad fight and she said, 
I, I can't let you do this. I cannot let you. And if you do, I'll call the police. And I thought she was mad enough she would. <laughs> and I, you know, and I was young enough to think, I don't know what the police are gonna do, but I don't want to see the police at our at our house. And, you know, we kind of, she, she calmed me down. We talked about it, you know, and she kind of more came out and she talked about, you know, what do you think is going to happen if you join the Sea Org? And to me, I revered, you know, those young adults at the Sea Org. I mean, the auditors and they just were so cool to me, you know, and it was the seventies and, and I just thought, I just want to be part of that. And I said, well, I'm going to make a lot of money. <laughs> and she laughed. <laughs> and okay. She said, you think you're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> and then she just, you know, laid it all out. This is what it's going to be like. You know, it's a billion year contract. Do you know what that means? That's your entire life. You're never, you know, you're never going to be able to do anything else. from that. Thank God for your mother telling you all that, because that is the truth. <laughs> yeah. Right? right. Thank God. And you know what? Janice, Janice, Pam, Pam would have ended up probably with you in the messengers in Clearwater and then at W out in La Quinta. She and was then, at that and, age, 17, and you know what? age as me. And I joined the Sea Org. I did the same thing, Pam. They, I would thought the Sea Org members were the coolest people in the DC Org at the time. And I joined the Sea Org right out of high school. Anyway, and you know ahead. what? Pam, you probably would be living in Las Vegas right now. <laughs> <laughs> a little too hot for me there, but yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, who knows, right? The, I mean, no, but exactly. your, story, your story parallels mine as, as far as getting in the Sea Org, because I, I decided to join in 75. I graduated in 76, and I was in Clearwater a month later. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, that, 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 was just, that was what happened, you know? Right, right. You know, and my, I mean, it was my, it was my boyfriend, but it's my husband. And, um, you know, we've talked about that, like, had he not been there, what different, ex, you know, outcome would have happened, had he not been there, had it just been my mom and I, you know, even if my mom had wanted to yell all those things at them, you know, I think she would have folded. I think that would have been really just, just too hard for her. I mean, I don't know, but so, yeah, so thank goodness I dodged a bullet and, um, that was the last I saw of them. That was the last that I was involved in Scientology. Um, fast forward though to, um, you know, my, my father passed when I was 19. So sadly, you know, that was the end of, of his life. Um, he never, he never stopped believing. He believed in the hospital, you know, that, um, right. you know, he was going to get better, you know, and that, you know, he, Scientologists never visited him. Nobody ever paid any attention to him. But, you know, in the before that, he had become an OT. Um, I found something in Advanced Magazine that he wrote, you know, about moving the ball around at a soccer game, exteriorating and controlling the flow of the game and sending a theta flow, you know, out here and out there. And I remember reading it and thinking, if he had all those powers, why couldn't he heal himself, right? Right. Why, why couldn't he make himself walk again? You know, I mean, that's right. the that's the sad part of Scientology. So, um, but but he believed, you know, until until the day he died. And my mom, nineteen years after my dad died, she had a brain aneurysm and she died suddenly. Um, so I was only thirty eight when she passed. And in the meantime, you know, I'd married and, and raised a family. And I remember talking to her before that, about five years prior to that. And she shared with me that she was dating Don Breeding, who was the inventor of the e-meter. That's and, right, in the 1950s. In the 1950s. That's right. Yeah. Mark, show that picture you have of the auditors with the e-meter. Oh, right. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So they'd been in D.C. with him. Um, you know, at the, at the time, they weren't. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, and so that the one on the left, that's what it looked like. Yeah, when I yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, that's that was yeah. an older version. The yeah. one. On the yeah, right that was the Mark Five. The Mark Five. Mark Five meter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like car names they gave them. <laughs> it's kind of funny to me. Well, like like the uh, the original e meter was the Matheson something or other, but exactly. yeah, Don Breeding was the one who was involved with it. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. And so, and there was that period of time when um, he didn't want to pay him the royalties, the Matheson one, and so then Don Breeding came in. So I, I found that whole story. But so my mom told me that um, she 
had reconnected with him. They had gone to the LRH, um, I guess there's a library or some event that happened in LA. She had gone there with him and that she was dating him. And I remember, you know, and everything was buried at that time. I mean, it was all under the surface. I hadn't thought about it or talked about it. I remember I looked at my mother and I said, I, I was just like flabbergasted. I thought, what is wrong with you? Like, why would you be doing that? And I said, you know, mom, I don't want to talk about it. I said, that period of my life was a nightmare and I don't want to talk about it. And sadly, I shut it down, sadly, you know, because little did I know, you know, she would die so suddenly and I would never, right. you know, to get to heal that with her. Um, but what did happen is I reached out to Don Breeding after her death. And she had his um, phone number, name and phone number in her address book that I, you know, found in her things. And he was really happy to hear from me because he said that it made sense now because he had been seeing pictures of office cubicles and she's never been to where she worked, but office cubicles and she must have been trying to tell him, you know, that she was gone. So that's right. that's. That's Scientology thinking. Um, <laughs> um, and he had an old timers newsletter that he put out at that time. And he said, could he, he, you know, we talked for a long time and he said, could he write about it? Kind of like how we podcast now, right? So could yeah. he write about it? And I said, yeah, I think that would be good. And my mom had written, um, she liked to write poetry and she had written a poem about Thetans. And it's a very cool poem, actually. It's a very hopeful poem. And um, I said, you know, I'd really like to put that in there. I was trying to think of some way to honor her. You know, after all that and all, even even at that time when I hadn't uncovered everything, I knew that she, somehow she needed to be honored for all her time in Scientology because nobody ever came back to care about my mom or my dad. Right. You know? Right. Once all that it, all those things had happened to them, and so he did, and and that was kind of a cool moment, you know, that that he wrote about it, and and um, you know, it memorialized kind of you know her experience in it. But um, that's my story. Um, so I was going to say we, we're going <laughs> to. I was going to say we need to wrap up here, but uh, go ahead, Janice. Go ahead. Is Don still alive, or did he pass? I was going to ask you that question. I mean, my guess is he may not be. Um, I do he would not have to be probably ninety to hundred years old. It's, at this exactly, point. <laughs> exactly, right, right, exactly. So you know, my my mom passed um, in nineteen ninety five when she was sixty one. Right. Yeah. So and and so I think he was a yeah. I think he was around the same age as my dad. My dad died at ninety three. Yeah. But. I yeah. remember Don coming to the ship for a brief period. Yeah, yeah, also, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So, well, yeah. Pam, and, go so ahead. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to wrap up. Tell people about your book. Or, you know, it's going to be published at some point, or, or, or what's, what's the deal with the book? Because you've obviously written about this in more detail, as well as looking into how this all occurred, right? Correct, right. So the book is called Clearly Lies Are True, um, and it should be out soon. Um, I'm working with publishers, and so um, I'll definitely either come back or let you know when it's out. Um, it has been a roller coaster. I remember we were talking to Janice about writing, and she said it's a roller coaster, and, and it truly <laughs> is. <laughs> There's so many ups and downs. Um, it's been freeing, though, and cathartic, and allowed me to make peace with having been a survivor of a cult. Um, and also having been a survivor of sexual abuse. So anybody yeah. that's dealing with any of that, um, I think will find um, it interesting and find some parallels and maybe find some hope in there. Right, that's fantastic. very good. So, well, yeah, absolutely. We will definitely, when you're, it's ready to publish, we'll have you on for sure and let everybody know where they can purchase it and, and uh, that type of thing, that'd be great. Thanks so much. It's just been really great to um, have a chance to talk to both of you. And um, it's so strange to me how, you know, life is full circle. So here we are, you know, <laughs> and all these years later, <laughs> decades, right. Talking about things that happened so long ago and realizing that, you know, we could have known each other even better. Yeah. So I'm glad we That's get right. to exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, it's Pam, been, it's been fun, Pam. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take Pam, I'm going to do a little business real quick and then don't hang up because we're, we're going to talk on the other side when we stop recording. Okay. okay. Anyway, I want to thank, 
I want to thank everybody for watching our, our video today. Please subscribe to our channel. Hit that like button. Hit the notification button. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments about what we talked about here today with Pam, go down in the comment section, write the questions, comments, anything like that, and we will definitely review them and answer them. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can buy us a coffee, go in the video description, click on the link. There's a way that you can help send support to our channel. And then finally, if you want to become a member of our channel, in addition to subscribing, right next to the join, uh, sorry, right next to the subscribe button on a PC or laptop on our channel page on YouTube, there's a join button. Click on that. There's a short video that describes the different perks that you get. Uh, you know, becoming a member of our channel, so we appreciate that. One last thing: if you want to buy Janice's book, there's a link down below, Commodore's Messenger Book One, and then we she's also got Commodore's Messenger Book Two. And they're both down below. You can click on them and get an autographed copy from Janice if you're interested in that from our merchandise store. I'm sorry about that. Let me take it down. There we go. Anyway, Pam, we want to thank you for being here. And we're looking forward to your book coming out. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Fantastic. Pam. Do anybody have anything else they want to say before we end? No, Just I've enjoyed this. Thank you. Oh, good. Keep doing the good work you're doing. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Okay, until next time, everybody, we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.